Hi, and welcome. Welcome to the Red Wagon Estate Planning and Elder Law Show with me, Jeff Palomo, yours truly. I hope you are doing very well today. I'm very excited about our podcast today, where we discuss all things estate planning and elder law. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit about what if I don't have any planning? You know, Jeff, I don't have millions. I'm not worth a ton. What do I need all this planning for? So I'm just going to chance it and not have anything. Or, you know what, Jeff? I'm going to save some money and I'm going to go and I'm going to get a do-it-yourself kit or I'm going to go online and get it done there. So what do you think about that? So we're going to talk about those two items today on our podcast show here at the Red Wagon Estate Planning and Elder Law Show. And as always, remember you can always go to Belomo and Associates website to get all of the upcoming workshops that we're hosting. We host weekly workshops on estate planning, crisis planning, special needs planning, as well as probate administration and trust administration. So please check us out for any information that you are looking for in regards to all things estate planning and elder law. We'd love to see you at one of those workshops. All right, so let's talk about it, right? Most people feel like they don't have millions of dollars, and I I hear that all the time. You know, I don't need what you do. And I say, "You really? You don't? No, I don't have millions. I don't have much at all. Well, that's one of the biggest mistakes that I think that we as a society make is that we equate estate planning with millions. And, and that's not the case. That's, that's not the truth at all. In fact, every individual over the age of 18 should have planning. The bottom line is, if you do not have a power of attorney in place and you lose capacity, you lose the ability to make decisions for yourself and you can't pay your bills, you can't pay your cell phone bill, your mortgage payment, your rent payment, somebody has to do that for you. And the mechanism that the law has in place is that you go to what is called a guardianship hearing, okay? Now, it it requires somebody to file a formal petition in the court. It requires somebody to serve the alleged incapacitated individual. Basically, service just means that they read the citation to them, where it goes something like this. You know, your loved one, so-and-so, has filed a petition in the court of common pleas indicating that you are incapacitated and not able to help yourself. You could be a detriment to yourself or to society. And a hearing is going to be had to determine your capacity on such and such a date in such and such a courtroom. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. Something similar to that. But, you know, just because somebody may not have capacity doesn't mean that they don't understand that they don't like it, that it doesn't feel right, right? Now, all of a sudden, they're being taken into a courtroom, and the person who is filing the petition is sitting at a different table than they are, and there might be different counsel sitting across from them. There's a judge in the room. There's somebody transcribing in the room. It's a very adversarial feeling, even even if we try not to make it. It's just how it's set up. Why? Because we want to protect your rights. We want to make sure that nobody's taking advantage of you. One of the things that we have in our society as a United States citizen is the ability to do what we want, right? The ability to be free and to have the the choice. Well, we want to make sure that no one's taking advantage and taking away that right. Because when a guardian is appointed, they literally take away your right to make a decision for yourself. So the judge just wants to be extremely careful that we don't accidentally appoint someone or take some away someone's rights. So we're going to take every precaution to ensure that that doesn't happen. Now, when you indicate we're going to take every precaution to make sure that doesn't happen, you know, I mentioned two attorneys, I mentioned a judge, I mentioned, you know, someone transcribing in the room, you know, obviously there's costs associated with that. A power of attorney might cost you a couple hundred dollars. A guardianship, several thousand dollars. So right there is the very first reason why an 18 year old needs to have a power of attorney in place. We don't know when an accident could happen. We don't know when a stroke could happen or something else catastrophic. And we want to make sure that that is in place so that not only do we have to not go through that process of the guardianship, but also so that we have the ability to 
have it taken care of for us at a much cheaper, inexpensive way, which would be a financial power of attorney. Gee, Jeff, I'm pretty sure there's a healthcare statute out there that would appoint somebody on the healthcare side, so I don't have to go through that. Well, you know, maybe. I mean, there is a healthcare statute, but the the joke I always give is, yeah, don't worry. Your spouse and your kids from a previous relationship, they'll hold hands and sing Kumbaya as they're making decisions in the hospital. Maybe, right? I mean, maybe they'll get along, but I generally see that there ends up being a fight, there ends up being a battle between them, and then we end up in a guardianship hearing anyway because we need to sort out that battle or sort out that fight. So, you know, that part doesn't necessarily go well nine times out of ten. Now let's talk about a will, right? A last will and testament is where you name where your assets are going to go that are in your name alone at the time of your death. If you don't have one, the government has one for you, right? And it's called intestate succession. Again, not perfect, just like the healthcare statute, but better than nothing, right? We're hoping to not have to go into a, a proceeding like a guardianship, and we don't. The, the government provides a statute for you. It's called intestate succession. Now, it's not perfect, right? The government had to make a decision about what somebody would want to do in a, circum- a certain circumstance and create rules based upon what they believe to be true. Now, just because they believe it to be true doesn't mean it is true for me, right? The, the one case that I always go back to uh, is a, a case where uh, a, a married couple, three kids, three boys, um, great family, and of course, you know, if, if one person dies, what is the assumption, right? The assumption is that everything goes to the spouse, and my wife will take care of everything. My wife will make sure my kids are taken care of. Now, in this situation, the kids are grown. You know, they're all in their 30s and 40s. The husband passes away suddenly, and the whole family comes into the office, and they were surprised. They were very surprised to hear that the wife gets to keep the first 30000 and then splits the remainder with the three boys, 50-50. Um, That was a shock to them. You know, the wife gets the first 30 and then they split the remainder. Uh, Very surprised. Now, we got very lucky, okay? We got very lucky in that case because the three boys just put the money back, gave it back to mom. We're very fortunate that we have um, the ability to give money to each other currently, you know, with the annual exclusion gifts and the federal exemption. that we can pretty much get money in back and forth to people tax-free, which is something that we've talked about uh, on another podcast, and we'll certainly talk about it in the future. But for the purpose of today, you know, we were lucky. We were able to do it. We were able to um, get everything back to mom, and, and she was put back in the place that she should have been. But there was a risk. Now, what was the risk? The risk there was what if the boys, any one of the three boys, what if they were in the middle of a divorce or if there was a car accident or if any of them had had a stroke and they were in a nursing home, right? Or if any of them had died in the middle of this process, well, any one of those things, plus probably 50 more that I'm not even thinking of, could have prohibited the ability for them to be able to give the money back to the mom. And also, we got lucky because the boys were good boys and they did what they knew mom and dad would want and they gave the money back. But you might be surprised how many children I have seen in the past 20 years when they didn't have to do something, they didn't do it. And their argument was, well, you know, it's the law. I don't have to. And and I'm in a position right now that I could sure use that money. So again, intestate succession is a good backup right? It, it's it's better than nothing. It, it might even arguably be better than the whole power of attorney side where we have to go to a guardianship hearing. I mean, that's a pain. That's expensive. It's emotional. So at least there is something if you don't have a will. But it's probably not what you want it to be. It's probably not the distributions that you're looking for. So plan ahead. Make sure that you're in control. Make sure that you make those decisions for yourself and for your family and get those documents in place so that we don't have to go to a guardianship hearing. We don't have to rely on a family not fighting for healthcare decisions. And we don't have to count on 
children giving money back to a parent in a situation where certainly everybody would have thought that the money would have gone to the mom. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about do-it-yourself kits or legal zoom or any one of the online uh, sources that are out there you know again arguably better than nothing I, you know i don't argue that i think that certainly having something in place is better than nothing the problem is these kits these these legal zoom things are done nationally right so they're out of california they're out of you know somewhere out west in arizona or New York, and every state's laws are different, right? So don't forget that. So one of the things that we have seen come up numerous times is that the wills themselves do not meet the Pennsylvania requirements to be self-proved. And then we're trying to search for witnesses. We're trying to search for the people who witnessed the document to bring them in after the person dies to sign an oath saying, yeah, that is their signature. Yeah. Maybe not the end of the world, but certainly held things up for several weeks. Certainly it was an inconvenience to the family that they were not expecting, right? In their head, they got this done. They got this done properly. So why do we have to go through these hoops if it was done properly? Well, that, that often will happen with a kit. Um, begin, again, because it's just generic across all of the states and every state's laws are different. And believe it or not, in most situations, Pennsylvania tends to be a little more uh, required, strict, difficult, whatever you want to call it. And uh, therefore, we tend to be the ones who you have to take the extra step for. Another thing that we see oftentimes is powers of attorney that are drafted uh, through a kit or online um, are not going to provide the powers that you need. So as you know from the estate planning uh, and elder law show here, we are able to do asset protection, right? Pennsylvania allows for it. You can do it in pre-planning. You can do it in crisis planning. And the key is that the document, the power of attorney, the financial power of attorney provides in it that you are allowed to do unlimited gifting for the purpose of Medicaid planning, asset protection, asset preservation, blah, 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 right? That specific language must be in the document. Now, what do we see nine times out of 10? Limited gifting, limited only to the amount of the annual exclusion gift. Well, that currently is what, $16,000 per year. If you've got a couple hundred thousand or whatever, and you wanna preserve assets at the time that a person needs a long-term care, the power of attorney must provide for it. I have not seen a do-it-yourself kit or a online uh, kit that's done by you know a national company or brand that provides for those hot powers, that provides for those specific powers that the statute says that we must specifically state. I've not seen it. So what happens, they come to us um, and here we are, they're going into a nursing home, a loved one's heading in and we do an analysis, we tell them what we can protect. Um, Currently in Pennsylvania, we're still allowed to protect 100 for the community spouse and 50% for a single individual, widow or widower, uh, who did no planning, which is huge. That's amazing, right? The current laws provide for that. Oh, but wait a minute. The document, the power of attorney doesn't authorize it. So now we have to go back to the individual who's going into the nursing home and see if they have legal capacity to be able to enter into a new power of attorney. And that's a tough place to be in. I mean, sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. So that isn't a situation, you know, in my mind, you don't want to try to be lucky. You know, that's that's not a good plan. That's not something you want to rely on. And frankly, if you're trying to be lucky by being able to do another document, why don't we just do it right, right? Why don't we just take care of it? We often share the story of a client of ours who uh, refused to use us. He ended up going to another uh, general practice attorney in town and, uh, you know, a wonderful, wonderful attorney, wonderful person. And my client was a great person. He'd used me for years. Um, he was always loyal to me, but he was able to save $75 and he did it. You know, he went downtown, he got his documents done, very reputable attorney. Uh, but the attorney is an estate planning attorney. He's a general practice attorney. He doesn't focus on the areas of asset protection 
Medicaid asset preservation and wealth. So the, his document provided for limited gifting and lo and behold, um, we were not able to do asset protection. We were not able to uh, have him do another one. He, there was no way he had no ability, no, no capacity whatsoever. And I'll never forget it. The, um, the children were walking out of my office and, you know, we could have protected about three, $400,000 and the son was laughing and he put his arm around his sister and he said, well, <laughs> at least we saved $75, right? Wow. You know, you lose several hundred, but boy, you, you save 75. So don't, don't, don't be silly about those decisions. Sometimes you want to get it done right. I always remember the oil fram filter commercials from the the 70s and 80s, you know, pay me now or pay me more later. And unfortunately, that is uh, a true statement. So those are the, the biggest things that we find. Um, another thing that comes up very often with these online uh, kits or the do-it-yourself kits is that they're just going to provide for outright distributions, right? So one of the stories that I do is in our workshops is called our psychic story where I close my eyes and I read your will to you. So as long as I did not draft your will, I'm gonna read the will that you currently have to you, okay? So I'm gonna close my eyes. So for those of you on the podcast and you cannot see me, envision that I'm closing my eyes and putting my two fingers to my temples, okay? Oh, oh. All right, I, Jeffrey R. Belomo, make this my last will and testament. I hereby revoke all previous wills and codicils there too. I appoint my wife Whitney as the executrix of my estate. In the event that my wife Whitney cannot do it, I appoint the oldest child. The executrix shall have the following responsibilities and they are, but are not included too, blah, 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 about a page and a half. All the rest residue and remainder, wherever situate, shall be given to my wife Whitney. In the event that my wife Whitney shall predecease me, it should go to my children in equal shares per stripes. Well, it's actually stirpes, right? So that sounds fine. And legally it's fine, right? Legally, you're fine. You're gonna get it, you're gonna get your will probated, you're gonna get your assets distributed. But let's take a closer look at what could happen in that situation, right? How did I die? Let's say I was in a car accident and my wife was with me. And she is completely disabled, going to spend the rest of her life in a nursing home. Well, because I made outright distributions to her, that money is going to be lost to long-term care, right? 100% of it will be gone, used for care, right? Had that money gone into a special needs trust for my wife or into a trust for my wife, that money would be fully protected and available for her but not be able to be taken by the nursing home. So there's a, there's a simple example of you think you're, you're getting done, something done easily. You think you're getting something done right. And just by how I died or who was with me at the time that I died could change the course of whether that plan is going to work. Now, what if she dies with me in that car accident? Well, the phrase was to our children in equal shares per stirpes. Well, we happen to have a 13 year old daughter, so it's going to go to her. Oh, but wait, when she turns 18, guess what she now receives? Yeah, a hundred percent of everything, right? Now, I hope that we raised her well. I hope that she's gonna make wonderful financial decisions, but is she gonna be ready to make those decisions at 18? You know, you have a couple hundred thousand dollars that lands on an 18 year old's lap a lot of things can go wrong. And the fancy attorneys, the, the fancy do-it-yourself kits and the Zoom things may provide, may provide that the money instead goes into a uniform transfers to minors account. Well, that's better than the original, but when she turns 21, now she gets the outright distribution. Again, I personally don't think that 21 is old enough. I don't think that we're ready to make clear decisions by ourselves without assistance. So in my case, my sister Dina is going to make those decisions for her. My sister Dina is going to distribute money to her for college, maybe for a wedding, for a down payment on a house, 
right? My sister will take care of those things for my daughter if we're not there to do them for her. Until when? Well, you know, that's up to you. My, my personal feeling is that the age can never be too high. Why? Because my sister can always give her the money if she sees fit. My sister could always just say to her, hey, you've earned it. You're doing everything the right way. Here you go. You know, dad wasn't trying to keep it from you. He was trying to protect it for you. But if you put on that document, 25 or 28, when they turn that age, they must receive the money outright. Well, the problem with that is, is if you're in the middle of an accident, divorce, stroke, heading into a nursing home, once you receive the entitlement to the money, it has to go. So that's certainly something that a lot of people don't think of, which is why I always encourage people to raise that age up, to bring it up higher so that the money's protected, it's protected for them, can still be given to them, but yet we can't lose it in case of a creditor floating out there. Another example uh, that we have had happen in a couple situations is where somebody wasn't anticipating another individual to be disabled, right? So that outright will that I read to you, the problem with it is, you know, the money goes outright. So if somebody is disabled and receiving public benefits, they've now lost their benefits and they've lost the money. So what we want to do is we want to build into our plans, special needs trust, understated age trusts, fallback provisions so that the money can be protected. I have never seen a do-it-yourself kit or an online company that did that. I've not seen that yet. Why? Because that's not their job, right? Their job is to get a basic plan in place for you so that it's better than nothing. But as I've said, you know, better than nothing is certainly not a high standard. It's certainly not a high bar. And I, I assure you, you know, the family who saved seventy five dollars but lost three to four hundred thousand wished that they had come to me, wished that they had done it the proper way. You know, we got away with a few things in a couple other cases where families didn't plan correctly, but you don't want to count on being lucky. So get your planning done properly. Go to a certified elder law attorney under authorization of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court somebody who specializes in this area, someone who does it all the time. Go to someone with the knowledge, with the expertise. You know you'll be taken care of. You know that the docs will be done properly so that you can rest easy knowing that your family will be taken care of in case of a catastrophic situation. That's why we offer the weekly workshops in our office so that you can come and be educated. I always say, I want to make sure that you're educated so what happened to my family doesn't happen to yours. Take the time, get the education, get the documents done properly. Well, I hope you enjoyed the podcast today. We talked a little bit today about uh, you know, what happens if you don't have planning, what happens if you have do-it-yourself planning. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Check us out on the web at www.belomoassociates.com. Or give the office a call at 717-845-5390. Thank you. We'll see you real soon.